Thank you, Alex, and to the organizers for inviting me to be part of this really exciting symposium. Um, I'm really glad to have the opportunity to talk about our new software tool, Human Neocortical Neurosolver, that was designed to study the circuit origin of human EEG and MEG, and I'm going to describe today how we can use this tool to study non-invasive brain stimulation. So I'd like to begin by giving you an overview of the challenge in human neuroscience that we aim to address by developing this tool. So we all know that EEG is a really powerful technology to study human brain dynamics because we can record from awake behaving humans with millisecond resolution. We can also have a direct readout of the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on neural circuits with EEG. But a downside is that what we're recording is the so-called macro scale activity that's generated by large ensembles of neurons. And it's still difficult to infer what's going on at the underlying cellular and circuit level. And this circuit level understanding is really critical if we want to use EEG to help us understand what non-invasive brain stimulation is doing to neural circuits and ultimately to help us design better stimulation pr protocols. Now, invasive recordings in animal models um, is obviously ideal for dissecting circuit level activity. And there's been some really great talks on this at the workshop over the past few days. Obviously, there's difficulties in doing these invasive recordings in humans, but computational neural modeling can be the ideal framework to bridge these EEG signals to the underlying circuit activity because with models, we can simulate the electrical activity of the neuron and we can have specificity both at this micro circuit scale and at this macro circuit recording level. And this is the primary focus of my research program. And we've recently turned this modeling framework into a software that we're calling Human Neocortical Neurosolver. I'll call it HNN for short. Um, and we're designing it as a user-friendly software tool for the community to start to develop and test predictions on the circuit origin of their EEG data and of the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on EEG signals. So in my talk, I'm gonna start by giving you an overview of some of the background of the development of this new tool. Um, and I'm gonna go through an example of how it can be used to study one of the most commonly measured EEG signals, a sensory evoked potential. And I'll be using an example from my lab where we've been studying tactile perception and tactile evoked responses. I'm then gonna give an example of how HNN can be applied to study the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on neural circuits behavior. And again, I'm gonna focus on a study from my lab where we've attempted to modulate tactile perception with transcranial alternating current stimulation. So how do we begin to develop a model that can bridge these signals that we're recording outside the head to what's going on inside the head? So the first thing we have to do is we have to understand where our data is coming from. Um, and so the first thing we do with an EEG signal is we apply an inverse solution method. And so we take our recordings and we apply standard methods to estimate the location, the direction, and the time course of the underlying electrical currents in the brain that are creating these EEG sensor signals. These currents are known as primary currents. From there, we need to be able to connect these primary currents that we estimate to the underlying circuit activity. And it's known that these primary currents are generated by the postsynaptic intracellular current flow in these long and spatially aligned cortical pyramidal neuron dendrites. Essentially, the, the length and alignment of these dendrites is such that you get this big electrical current. And when you sum over a large population, you get an electrical and a magnetic signal that's large enough to be recorded outside of the head. And so knowing that this is where the signal comes from, there are some key features in cortical circuitry that we need to be including in our model if we wanna have a model of the circuit level underpinnings of EEG or MEG signals. And so the first canonical feature to consider is that the cortex is a layered structure. So EEG and MEG are primarily reflecting activity from the cortex. The cortex has layers with these pyramidal neurons that have these long apical dendrites in the supergranular and infragranular layers. They're synaptically coupled to other excitatory and inhibitory neurons. 
These cortical networks aren't sitting in isolation, but they're always receiving inputs from other parts of the brain. And there are two primary pathways of information flow into the cortical circuits. One, which we're gonna to refer to as a feed forward input. This is input that comes from the lumniscal thalamus. It relays sensory information from the periphery up to the thalamus and into the cortex, into the granular layers where it then propagates to the pyramidal neuron dendrites of these long pyramidal neurons. Another pathway of information is from these feedback inputs that go right up into the supergranular layers. These are the inputs that come from higher order cortical areas, or there are these non lumniscal thalamic nuclei that also project right up to the supergranular layers. Now, with this construction, this primary current dipole signal that we're estimating with our inverse solution techniques is coming again from the net intracellular current flow across the whole population of pyramidal neurons. Now, with this construction in a model, the units of measure that you get are current over distance or nanoampere meter. That's the same unit of measure that you get when you do your source localization to your sensor data. And so we have one-to-one -one comparison between the output of a model that's constructed this way and our source localized data. Now we know something about the size of the networks that contribute to some of the most commonly measured EEG and MEG signals. So when we record outside of the head with EEG or MEG, we're typically looking at either event-related potentials, these are sensory evoked responses. They're usually on the order of 10 to 100 nanoampere meters and believed to be generated by on the order of tens of thousands of synchronously firing pyramidal neurons. We also measure low frequency oscillations, oscillations in the delta, theta, alpha, beta, gamma band. These are much larger in amplitude, typically around 100 to 1,000 nanoampere meters. And they're believed to be generated on, by on the order of a million pyramidal neurons that are working in a sub-threshold regime. So it's not that you have a million parameters firing action potentials, but their sub-threshold behavior in their dendrites creates these large low frequency oscillations. So these are the features that we included in um, the model circuit underlying HNN. And I'm just gonna give you a bit more detail here. The pyramidal neurons are simulated with multi-compartment neurons. The, single, the inhibitory neurons are simulated with single compartments because they're not contributing directly to this signal that we're recording, but they're none of the less important for the dynamics of the local network. We synaptically couple the excitatory and inhibitory cells with GABAergic and glutamatergic synapses. We calculate the voltage of every compartment using Hodgkin-Huxley dynamics, where we have active ionic conductances in the soma and dendritic compartments of the cells. And then, as I've mentioned, we calculate this primary current dipole signal that we're going to be comparing to our data by just summing up the intracellular current flow along these pyramidal neuron dendrites. Now, importantly, we have these pathways of input to the cortical circuit. In our model, we don't simulate all the brain areas that interact with each other. Instead, what we do is we generate trains of action potentials in predefined patterns that activate the local network through these excitatory synapses and this feed forward projection pattern, which we call proximal drive because it essentially hits the proximal dendrites of these pyramidal neurons, or in this feedback pattern that hits the distal dendrites of the pyramidal neurons, and so we call that distal drive. And so, for example, I can simulate a train of action potentials. It's going to activate these excitatory synapses, and that can push current flow up the dendrites to create a positive deflecting signal. If I have a train of action potentials that I simulate and they contact excitatory synapses on the distal dendrites, that's gonna push current flow down the signal. And it's the interaction of these exogenous inputs with the local network dynamics that create this macro scale current dipole, primary current signal that we're recording. So that was a reduced representation. The full network represents a patch of cortical circuit. We are designing this software to be able to study these commonly measured EEG signals, ERPs in low frequency brain rhythms. Now, this is schematic 
of the network. Um, this is obviously a large scale computational model. There's literally thousands of differential equations and even more parameters that are regulating the dynamics of this network. And so what we've been trying to do is take that complexity out of the hands of the user. And so we've embedded this large scale model in a graphical user interface. Um, and this is our graphical user interface. And so we're trying to teach the community how to interact with this model to study the origin, the multi-scale origin of ERPs in low frequency oscillations. We've created a website that contains instructions on how to install the software, tutorials of use. We give example data sets and parameter sets uh, building from our own studies where we've looked at ERPs in alpha rhythms, beta rhythms, gamma rhythms. And so we have a um, website that's dedicated to distributing all that information. The code is distributed on GitHub, and we're also trying to be very careful in designing this with best open source software design um, practices. And so we encourage the community to help us construct it. But really, the way to start is with this graphical user interface, learning how to interact with this large scale model. And so I'm gonna walk you through an example of how to use this software to study a sensory evoked potential. Um, and again, I'm using data from my lab, where in my lab we do tactile detection experiments. We give brief taps to the finger of our subjects and we ask them, did you feel it or did you not feel it? And we're keeping it so that they feel it half of the time so we can look at correlates of detection. We apply these standard inverse solution techniques to isolate the contribution to the signal from the hand area of S1. And so what I'm going to show you now is what the evoked response from the hand area of S1 looks like. Now this is from a strong tap to the finger where the subject feels it 100% of the time. And we can load this data into our HNN software. And so then with our software, we wanted to study, well, what are the underlying mechanisms that create this ERP? Um, and fortunately, there's a large history of literature on where these evoked response potentials are coming from, particularly in somatosensory cortex. And so the idea is that there's a sequence of input that activates this local network. And so here's your local network, the underlying model. Any simulation experiment is going to consist of defining a sequence of drive to this local network. We tested the hypothesis that this prior theory on where these signals come from could create this macro scale ERP. And so the prior theory, this is from invasive recordings and lots of history of work, suggests that after you tap the finger, there's a feed forward input to the local circuit at approximately 25 milliseconds. That's followed by a feedback input to the local S1 circuit at approximately 70 milliseconds. And then there's a thalamocortical loop of activity and another re-emergent feed forward input at 125 milliseconds. And so the way we use the software is we test the hypothesis that this sequence of activation can generate this S1 ERP. And so what we did is we simulated a train of action potentials. This is a histogram on the top of the train of action potentials that we simulate in this feed forward and feedback or proximal and distal projection pathway. So we've got a sequence of input at 25 milliseconds followed by a distal input at 70 and then a proximal input at around 125 milliseconds. And then when we hit run simulation, these inputs, they come in, they activate the local network and then the network responds dynamically and the output is this intracellular current flow across the pyramidal neuron dendrites. And what we found was indeed this sequence of drive can reproduce this macroscale ERP. Now, importantly, while the literature guided us how we should be stimulating this network, we spent a long time tuning the number of inputs, the strength of the inputs, the timing of these inputs, and all that information is giving us further predictions about where this signal is coming from in the underlying circuit. So now we have a representation of the ERP. And part of what we've been doing is looking at, OK, well, where the correlates of I felt it and didn't feel it in the tactile evoked response coming from? The other thing, but I'm not going to describe that to you. What I'm going to describe is that we've been using this software to understand the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on neural circuits in tactile detection. Now, before I get to 
our non-invasive brain stimulation study. I wanna briefly show you how we've applied this software to study some other common event-related potentials. And so I've been showing you data from the somatosensory cortex where we give a tap to the finger. This is data from the auditory cortex where you give a brief tone or a brief sound. And this is data from visual cortex where you have a brief flash of a checkerboard. And while there's differences in these waveforms, one thing that you can see is that there's also commonality. They all start by going up and then they have a large deflection that goes down and then it comes back up again. And what we've shown with our software is that with the same sequence of input, this feed forward, feedback, feed forward projection pattern to the local cortical structure, we can reproduce each of these ERPs. Now, again, we had to tune the timing and the strength and the number of these inputs to get an accurate representation of our signal. But what this is telling us is that at the macro scale, these recordings that we get outside of the head, they're largely dictated by the structure of the cortical column and these canonical sequences of information flow that come into that network from a sensory evoked response. Okay, so now I'm gonna to turn to how we've been using our software to study the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation. So in addition to looking at the tactile evoked response, we've also been looking at the spontaneous oscillations in S1 and thinking about how they relate to perception. And so what I'm showing you here again, this is the same tactile detection experiment. We're looking at a signal that's been source localized to the hand area of S1. And this is the signal before we tap the finger. And what you see is, is this large amplitude, low frequency oscillation. If we put a frequency filter on that signal, this is just a standard wavelet analysis. You can see that there's high power in the alpha, the seven to 14 hertz band, and in what we call the beta band, the 15 to 29 hertz band. And when you tap the finger, these oscillations desynchronize. But one of the questions we were interested in is does the power of this oscillation in the pre-stimulus period predict whether the subject will feel the tap to the finger or not? So sometimes when the tap comes in, you're in high power and sometimes you're in low power. We've seen that the power shifts with attention. And so we wanted to see does that oscillation have an impact on perception? And the answer is that it does. On trials, this is just sorting over trials where the subject said, I, I felt the tap to the finger. And these are trials where the subject said, I didn't feel the tap to the finger. And you can see very clearly that on non-detected trials, there's higher power in this pre-stimulus and also in the posterior stimulus period. We looked at this, <clears throat> sorted the data from low to high power. Um, so here what we're doing is we're averaging in the pre-stimulus time window, we're averaging over these alpha and beta bands, and we're sorting the power from low to high and looking at the detection rate as a percent change in hit rate from the mean. And so the higher it is, the more likely the subject is to say, I felt the tap to the finger. And what we found is there's this linear relationship such that the higher power you have, the less likely you are to feel that tap. And so we think of these <clears throat> pre-stimulus rhythms as inhibiting to perception. We've also seen when you pay attention to the fingertip, these pre-stimulus oscillations decrease, suggesting that they get out of the way for optimal information processing. And so what we wanted to ask was, could we use non-invasive brain stimulation to entrain these oscillations and in doing so, inhibit the ability for the subject to feel that tap to the finger? And if we can, and we can look at the corresponding EEG signal, can we use our HNN modeling framework to interpret the circuit level effect of non-invasive brain stimulation on our S1 circuit by looking at its impact on the EEG signal? And so we started by looking at alpha and asked the question, can we entrain alpha? Can we see that on our EEG signal and does it inhibit perception? And so for this, we used alternating current stimulation um, we had a low amplitude signal over the contralateral somatosensory cortex. We gave a 10 minutes of individualized alpha frequency transcranial alternating current stimulation. And we designed our experiment so that the alpha stimulation was on for six seconds and then off for six seconds, on for six seconds and off for six seconds. And again, it was very low amplitude at one milliamp. We did that in hopes that we would be able to see alpha entrainment in these periods where the stimulation was off. Um, 
A punchline is we weren't able to look at these signals with our recording, unfortunately, because there were a lot of artifacts, um, but I'll show you the data in just a minute. And then we compared that to a sham condition where we just had a ramp on and then an off of the signal. And we looked at the EEG signal before the tax stimulation, during the tax stimulation, and after the tax stimulation, this 10 minute period of this experimental paradigm. Again, we weren't able to look at the data during tax because of artifacts, but we weren't able to compare pre to post tax conditions. Um, and what we found is that we didn't have a significant impact on alpha oscillations. And so if we look in the pre-stimulus period in either the stimulation or the sham condition, you can see that the subjects have these 10 Hertz oscillations, but there's no difference pre to post stimulation. So we weren't in training alpha with this protocol. Now there's lots of reasons why we may not have it. it was very weak. We had the six seconds on and off. And so there may be things in our experimental design where we couldn't have seen that. We also didn't see a lasting impact of this alpha frequency stimulation on tactile detection performance. And so during stimulation, we did have a decrease in performance, but it didn't hold up to be significantly statistically significant in the post-stimulus period. So we didn't have this lasting impact from our stimulation. But what we did see was that there was a significant impact on the tactile evoked response. And so this is the tactile evoked response in this condition before we gave our 10 hertz stimulation. And here it is after we gave our 10 hertz stimulation. And this prominent peak at around 70 milliseconds, it was lower after the stimulation. And so now we have something in our EEG signal that we can apply HNN to study how might this be coming about in the neural circuit. And so we go to our HNN software. Here we're um, looking at simulating this pre-tax condition. And so we have this, uh, this is a uh, blow up of what I've shown you before, but we have this sequence of input that defines our S1 ERP. This feedback input creates this downward deflection and this, this later feed forward input is creating this upward deflection. And so we tune the model to the pre-tax condition. And now we want to test hypothesis about how can we get this increase, I'm sorry, it's an increase in the amplitude, but a decrease in the overall value of this 70 millisecond in later response. And so here again, we use HNN as a hypothesis testing tool. What do we know about what's going on with this alpha frequency stimulation? Well, the hypothesis we wanted to test based on things of prior literature and what we know about what this alpha frequency tax might be doing to the neural circuit is that maybe it's changing the local network synaptic plasticity, changing the ratio of the excitatory inhibitory synaptic connections in the local network to create this post-stimulus effect. And so we have an easy way in our software to test that. You can go into set parameters and we have the synaptic gains button. And what that does is it changes the strength of the excitatory and inhibitory synapses in the local network by some factor. And so you can increase the excitatory to excitatory synapses by a factor of two, the excitatory to inhibitory, inhibitory to excitatory, or just the inhibitory. And so this is what we did. We said, well, what happens if we, gain, if we increase all of the local synapses by a factor of two? Now we can do that, we hit run simulation. And what we found was indeed, this was able to create this lower amplitude 70, 80 millisecond response. But what happened later doesn't match what we saw in our data. So then we said, well, maybe it's preferentially acting on the excitatory synapses. And so we can go in and we can increase only the excitatory synapses in the network and not the inhibitory synapses. And when we did that, we saw the, the waveform actually went in the opposite direction. Everything was increased. So then we said, well, maybe it's only the inhibitory synapses. What happens if we just change the inhibitory synapses? So they're two times stronger, but leave the excitatory synapses alone. And we found that indeed, when we increased only the inhibitory synapses, we were able to get that downward increase in this 70, 80 millisecond response, as well as the fact that this stayed lower across this whole 130 millisecond time window. And so now we have a prediction from our model that what's going on is that with low intensity 
10 hertz stimulation, we're preferentially potentiating the inhibitory synapses. And there's some evidence in the literature and now even some more recent evidence, we've seen some examples of this in the workshop that what this electrical stimulation may be doing, particularly at low amplitude, is potentiating inhibitory synapses. Now, because this is a model, we can go in and we can look at, well, this is the macro scale signal. What's happening in the underlying circuit? We can look at the spiking activity of every neuron in the network. We can look at the layer specific responses. We can look at the frequency responses of all the cells in the network. And so if we dive in a little bit more deeply and to look at um, these underlying details, you can go into view. Here, I'm gonna click view simulation spiking activity. And when I do that, I see the spiking activity of all the different cells in my network and they're color co coded. So here's the layer two, three excitatory and inhibitory cells and the layer five cells. This is the spiking response in this pre-stimulation condition. This is the one that gives rise to this blue waveform. Um, and what you can see is between 70 and 80 milliseconds, you get a lot of spiking. Now, when I increase the inhibition twofold, then what happens is I get much less spiking at this 70 millisecond response. That decrease in spiking is corresponding to a lower amplitude signal. It's pulling current flow further down the dendrites from this distal stimulation. And so now, and it's that that's reducing the amplitude of this SEP. And so now we have several targeted predictions that we can go in and test further with invasive recordings or maybe GABA spectroscopy and other imaging modalities to start to get a multi-level dissection of what's going on at the underlying circuit. So the problem with our study was we didn't impact reception and that's ultimately what we were trying to do. So the next thing that we did is we took a step back and said, well, let's take a closer look at our data and C might, might be more effective. And we saw that there's actually a greater impact on perception with this beta frequency oscillation than with our alpha frequency oscillation. And so we wanted to ask, could we instead entrain this beta oscillation and in doing so have a greater impact on tactile perception? But the first thing we did was we took a closer look at our data. Um, and what I'm showing you here is 10 epochs of this pre-stimulus period before we tap the finger. And this is the average across 100 trials. And what we found is that in on average data, these beta oscillations are very transient in time. They typically last less than 150 milliseconds. And it's only because of averaging that we get this impression that there's this ongoing oscillation at 20 hertz. It's in fact very transient. Um, and because these signals are positive in the spectral domain, they accumulate without cancellation to give this continuous appearance of a continuous oscillation. But at any moment in time, you either have a beta event, or we call them events because they're brief in time, or you don't have a beta event. And so given that this is what the signal looks like, we had to step back and say, well, what is it that's impacting perception? Remember, the higher the pre-stimulus beta power, the less likely you are to feel the tap to this finger. The lower the power, the more likely you are to feel the tap. Well, now that we know that there's these transient oscillations, there's several features that could be contributing to a difference in average power that might be impacting perception. It could be that on trials where we had low power, we had a small number of events. And on trials that had high power, we had more events of the same amplitude. It could have been that on trials where we had low power, we had low amplitude events. In high power, you've got the same number of events, but they're actually higher in amplitude. It could be that their duration was longer, or it could be that the frequency span was different. Any one of these could underlie a difference in high and low average power. And so the first thing we did was we looked at our data and we said, well, which is it? What is actually influencing average power and perception? without showing you details, what we found was it's actually a greater number of events in the pre-stimulus period that's causing the average power to be higher and that's having an influence on perception. And not only is it the number of events that matters, the timing of these events also matters. 
such that the closer they occurred to when we tap the finger, the more likely they were to be inhibitory to a perception. We've also now used our modeling to under, try to understand, well, what's creating these beta oscillations or these beta events in our data? And why, when they're there and close to the tap to the finger, do they inhibit perception? And what the modeling is suggesting is what these beta generating mechanisms in the brain are doing as they're recruiting inhibition in the supergranular layers. And this inhibition is inhibiting the relay of information out of the primary somatosensory cortex. Remember, we're recording from the primary somatosensory hand area. And if you have a lot of inhibition in the hand area before you tap the finger, the tap never reaches the cortex, never gets out of S1, and the subject says, I don't feel the tap to the finger. Okay, so now given this information, how might we apply this knowledge to more accurately account for these transient brain rhythms with our non-invasive brain stimulation? And so what we're doing now is we're trying to redesign our brain stimulation experiments so that we more accurately account for this endogenous expression of these rhythms. We're not seeing continuous oscillations. Maybe what we, should, we shouldn't be trying to entrain continuous oscillations. What we're seeing is this probabilistic process in these high power events. And so now we're taking a step back. We're actually in my lab now using TMS so that we can really have an impact on the circuits. And we're trying to develop paradigms that more naturally mimic this natural expression of these um, probabilistic events in the brain. The other thing that we're now doing is that we're trying to integrate HNN in these field modeling frameworks. You know, there's really exciting developments with SIMNIBs and NEMO TMS to simulate the field activity and try to connect it to the neural circuits. And as a next step, we wanna go in and connect this field modeling to our HNN modeling framework. And that's all now work in progress. And so that brings me to my conclusions. Um, HNN is this neocortical column model under thalamocortical and cortical drive. We've developed it into this user-friendly software for the communities to start to develop and test predictions on the origin of their signal. And hopefully I've showed you how it can currently be applied to study the impact of non-invasive brain stimulation on neural circuits. Um, I, of course, want to thank my collaborators in my lab. I'm highlighting Daniel Sliva, who's a graduate student in the group, who was the um, person who led the study of our tax stimulation and modeling. And the HNN development team is a team from Brown, the Martino Center, Yale University, and the Nathan Klein Institute. Um, and I have a really active lab in interaction with lots of amazing people that helped me do this interdisciplinary research. Um, and so with that, I thank you for your time. And I apologize that I seem to have um, gone over and into the break period, but thank you again. All right. Thank, thanks so much. No problem. This was a fantastic talk. Um, I think this has huge implications how we understand non-invasive brain stimulation, how we design closed loop experiments. And um, I mean, I think also the integration with the electric feed, I think that's, that's be, be very important. So I was wondering, I, I kind of understand something like TACS that will mostly affect those large pyramidal neurons and, um, and, and train them, but something, some other cells like basket cells due to different morphology, they're probably less effective. So I was wondering to somewhat extend that to mimic some type of neuron specific effects on, on different cells, but still somewhat simulate a network response. Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. Um, we haven't done this yet for our TMS studies. But even with the preliminary data that we have from our TMS, at this point, we don't, we're not simulating the fields, right? We don't have a direct connection of the field effect onto the model, but what we do have is what the EEG signal looks like with and without the TMS. Um, and when we look at that, and this is very preliminary days, it seems like the thing that's affecting the signal the most is the inhibitory influences. Um, and so for the, the protocols that we're using, now we're using these brief um, stimuli, they seem to be maybe impacting in the supergranular layers, preferentially the inhibitory neurons. Why that's true, if it's actually true, we don't know. We need to go in and couple these together, but there's, um, you know, their threshold for firing is a lot lower. And so you can imagine that 
they're more impacted by the TMS and just have the higher firing rates. And so with repeated stimulation that could cause plasticity in the inhibitory synapses more than the excitatory, only because you're driving them more, even though they they may be less susceptible because of their morphology, they may be more susceptible because of their intrinsic dynamics. 